We were born May 28, 1943, when they called us the 303rd Troop Carrier Squadron. Assigned to the 442nd Troop Carrier Group, operating out of Sedalia Army Airfield, Missouri. We were there on D-Day, delivering troops to fight in one of the most notorious battles in history and continued to serve throughout the remainder of World War II. Inactivated in 46 and reactivated in 49 in Fairfax Field, Kansas City, Kansas, the 303rd Troop Carrier Squadron was officially assigned to the Air Force Reserve. During the Korean War, the squadron sent its C-119 flying boxcars and pilots out to active duty units to support coalition forces with cargo and personnel drops. The squadron's C-124s were activated during the Berlin Crisis in 61, and from 66 to 71, provided support for ongoing activities in Southeast Asia through the Vietnam War. In 1982, we were no longer carriers, but fighters, flying the A-10 Thunderbolt II, affectionately known as the Warthog. We became the 303rd Fighter Squadron. After the attacks on 9-11, we flew back-to-back -back combat missions in support of operations Enduring Freedom, Iraqi Freedom, and Freedom Sentinel, eight different times. During the most tumultuous times in the Middle East, we provided close air support, combat search and rescue, and forward air control combat capability. We are a combat-laden and proven fighter pilot organization and we stand upon the shoulders of giants. You will hear from leaders this week, past and present, who have been instrumental to our heritage as the world's greatest fighter squadron. Seriously. We have submitted our legacy in the history books as a premier fighter pilot union. Deploying and utilizing the tactics we practice at home at a moment's notice, anytime, anywhere. We defend our constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic, and we understand that our constitutional rights are earned, not given. We are the 303rd Fighter Squadron. Attack. We were um, known by many of the other fighter units in the reserves with somewhat an envious uh, name as uh, Camelot because it was such a neat place to be with strong leadership and good Midwestern work ethic. And uh, it was, it was a perfect place to be. RG was a magical place to start of the fighter's squadron. If you had to convert 130s into 810s. The fighter squadron, they're very selective about who they picked and uh, picked the best. And that's why they've had such a remarkable record. I met the 303rd in 1987, uh, they were getting ready for their NATO Tacomount deployment to Europe. I was the project officer for the NATO Tacomount on the active duty side. I got sent to to uh, Belton, Missouri, which I didn't even know where it was, to find out who these guys were. And uh, I brought my boss, who was a, a ops officer, with me. And I spent a week with these guys, and that's when I knew right away. This is where I want to end up. <laughs> I went back and the squadron commander, Colonel Hines, said, he goes, well, how bad's it gonna be? Uh, are they as weak as I think they are? And I said, boss, I think you got it backwards. I said, they're not the weak ones, we are. <laughs> and at that point, that's when I knew I wanted to be part of the 303rd. Yeah. I'd say what makes the unit really special are the, are the dudes and the families that, that choose to come here. I mean, it's not, it's not LA and it's not, you know, the East Coast where you might get a lot more attraction for people. Uh, there's not a whole lot around here, so the folks that, that end up coming into the unit, want, they're either from the area or they want to come to where it's way more laid back than some of the other places. It was all worth it because it was a unit, you know. It was so much fun being in the unit every day, just like you guys talk about, coming to work was fun. Mm -hmm. I chose to try to participate in the process of becoming a member of the 303rd, but they certainly did the choosing. It was hard to get in this unit. Uh, a lot of people, most everyone flying the intense wanted to come here. So I was very fortunate. 
we, we hire people, we hire personalities, yeah. as opposed to, we hire people that will fit in the squadron, as opposed to hiring a, you know, the top dog that has patch wear, you know. So we kind of avoided those egos, you know, and then that people that were willing to work together to get the job done, I think that's what made us go really, really special. I remember when I was up in Alaska, you guys came up there, and I, I decided that if I got out of the unit, and that I, this is where I was going to apply. I wasn't going to apply anyplace else. So much so that when I left Alaska, I shipped my stuff to Missouri. The camaraderie. I mean, it, I, I, I'm going golfing on Friday with with Mark Ronco, Tony Johnson, and Denny Taylor. You know, and I, I, I go golfing all the time with the, the guys that are retired. Through, they're, they're my best friends. I knew from the get go that this was a place that I wanted to call. You know, my last ever fighter squadron, a place I wanted to be a part of. So you got to know people on a one name-to-name -name basis. You made friends with them. <clears throat> they they understood that you appreciated them, and they didn't want to let you down. He's able to go over there because it's a good relationship with maintenance and arms, right? I mean, uh, there's some, you know, some maybe not have that, so he's comfortable walking over and saying, "Hey, I want to help out, you know, turn some wrenches here on the, on the maintenance side." Uh, I think we had a great cadre of pilots, but we would not be able to be who we were if it wasn't for our maintainers. Those guys. I learned more about being a commander from the two chiefs that worked for me than I learned from any other book or anybody else. Those guys were just top shelf all the way around. The relationship with maintenance is like none other, I, I think. We actually got the Aircraft Generation Squadron embedded in the squadron. So for three squadron commanders, we actually had the aircraft generation squadron in the squadron. So we, instead of going having a 40, you know, personnel squadron, we ended up with 200. You know? Right. And then, and I've always seen that maintenance and ops were adversarial, at least on active duty. We would build a schedule, go well, let's let's put this on there and see if they can deliver it. And they go, it's a maintenance time delivery. And so we end up, so we go screw to the boss. It's their fault. No, it's their fault. And we were looking for reasons to blame. Um, right. you know, the other unit, whereas when we put the squadron and uh, main unit together, every day, production soup would come over to the squadron and go, what do you need today, right? And we say, okay, we need 16, you know, swords, an eight turn eight. They go, uh, how about an eight turn seven? Uh, okay, if we can make that up tomorrow, okay, we can do that, because we got this airplane coming out of uh, hangar queen status and they'll we'll generate more airplanes, and that, to me, yeah, when you got to work face to face with people like Don Shoot and, and Steve Brazil, and they came over every single day looking to see what we needed to make the mission a success, I think that you know, that was outstanding. I think it's just been um, passed down over the years the importance to have a good relationship with the maintenance guys. Like I said, uh, guys like uh, uh, Farmer and Burgess, Eric Vanderlyn, and both went on to be maintenance group commanders, and uh, they kind of showed. Guys my age, like uh, uh, Borg and myself and Rags and Jimmy Mack, the importance to have a good relationship with maintenance, not just at work and producing sorties, but having a beer with them, going fishing with them, playing uh, softball, basketball with them. And I think that builds uh, a good cohesive organization if you have a relationship with folks outside of work. I think part of it, it, it starts, it's not really the turning wrenches, it starts with just having uh, camaraderie with your, with your crew chief. In 82, we were not happily received when we started the unit. <clears throat> and it had an all ranks club, which was completely different than the Whiteman Club. And uh, we got face the face time of everybody from the comm squadron to the maintenance, the technicians. So you got to know people on a one name to name basis. You made friends with them. <clears throat> they, they understood that you appreciated them and they didn't want to let you down. You know, early 90s when everything switched from being fun, everything, you yeah. know, you, we, we figured out our deployments by just where we wanted to go, you yeah. know? And it just switched over to, you know, hey, you're gonna send you guys to real places, you know, and everything else. And everything changed. First fixed wing squadron in the uh, U.S. military, not just the Air Force, in the U.S. military that deployed into Iraq was the 303rd Fighter Squadron. This A-10 squadron, if you look at the banners in the hall, has pretty much lived in Afghanistan for the last 20 years. In fact, there were people who just couldn't believe their mission-capable rate on the airplanes, how 
magnificent it was, like 97%. It's a squadron that's heavily focused on tactics. You can go to other squadrons that maybe not so much for a variety of reasons. Maybe there's too many you know, young folks and they don't have time to dig heavily into the tactics. Maybe it's a culture, whatever. But I, I think the culture here at the third, third fighter squadron is very, be a very tactically sound pilot. Um, so we're always ready. Um, readiness is strong. You never know what your legacy is going to be. All you, at the time, you just do the best you can. And, and I think the fact that we have, uh, we've always got the mission accomplished. If, if it was in going to a air base in Iraq and living in, in uh, pretty uh, uh, tough conditions for, for a year and making it better and getting the job done, or first unit in the reserve with the tardy pods and kind of designing a lot of the tactics, uh, that's really been fun. Like always being the first to have a lot of the, the new stuff. It's been tough. They didn't miss a single combat sortie for maintenance. They just perform magnificently. So between maintenance and operations, living in very austere conditions, the 303rd Fighter Squadron in Iraq was just magnificent. All the fighter pilots in this room have had this happen, where someone says, you know, you're fighter pilots, you get to do this, and you get to do that. And you get these great buildings, you get to have a bar in your squadron, and you're spoiled, and you go out and do some stupid stuff, and then get punished, which is not true. It turns out I've got seven counts of UCMJ. <laughs> but that's the perception, and they talk about what we get to do. And I thought about that. Here's what we get to do. Casey Campbell said back there, she got to take off on a sortie of the A-10 in Iraq in 2003, and she got to get shot up. She, got, she lost all her hydraulics as a young captain. She got to decide whether she was going to punch out over enemy territory in Iraq and the people she was just shooting straight. She got to do that. Then she got back into safe territory and she got to make the decision whether she was going to punch out in Kuwait or try to land this and save the plane. She got to do that. Then she got to go out and do it again the next day. Her husband, Sue Campbell, takes off as a new weapons officer. He flies in from Kuwait to Afghanistan when this thing kicks off and goes into the most prolific battle to date in Afghanistan. It's a cluster. He sorts it out. We lost hundreds of lives that day. He saved hundreds if not thousands of lives and he devastated in the most violent fashion what American air power could do by sorting that out. He got to do that. He didn't know where he was landing when he was done. He ended up a bagger, which is where that opened up, quite frankly, for our power. We get to fly into the Kunar Valley. We get to do that. There's 20 foot, 20,000 foot mountains surrounding three sides of the Pakistan border on the other. And that's where a lot of our fighting occurs. You do it under the weather at night with troops in contact, where you can't see anything through the goggles because there's no cultural lighting, and you're doing troops in contact shooting 50, 60 feet away from our guys at night, wondering if when you pull off and make a mistake, you get to fly into a mountain. Or you get to do a border breach. You get to sit on top of a young man calling in fire. And there's gunfire in the background. He's begging, not begging, he's so professional. He's, he's, he's laying it out so that we can attack. And you do. And then he says, it's stopped there, and you feel good for a second. And then you look to the north, and he says, it's coming in from the north. And then I get to hear him stop talking. He's never going to talk again. We get to do that. Don't be ashamed of your fighting power heritage. When you come back from these sorties and you're sitting with adrenaline pouring out of your body, and you got the shakes, and you're trying to get yourself under control from the adrenaline so that you can get out of the airplane and look cool to your crew chief because you never want to look like an idiot. I flew the last ever A-10 mission over there. Incredibly touching and fulfilling for me to get to have, you know, the 303rd patch on my shoulder and do that. There's a great deal of uncertainty in the world today. Uh, and a great deal of uncertainty about the A-10 Enterprise. Uh, uh, my most rewarding uh, experiences so far have been uh, how aggressively uh, 
our squadron and its and its members have have pursued uh, tactical growth, uh, moving on to uh, new and, and and upcoming mission sets that that we might encounter anywhere in the world. Uh, so, uh, you know, we're not we're not taking the knee. Uh, we're we're uh, we're aggressively uh, uh, exploring new new. Uh, new mission sets and, and new tactics and, and demonstrating capabilities that frankly uh, not a lot of other units uh, can can do. And uh, what it does is it's uh, maintained our relevance uh, and uh, increasing uh, our exposure in by demonstrating that we have significant capabilities that we can bring to combatant commanders throughout the world. Uh, and that's been the most rewarding thing is seeing the training exercises and, and the TDYs that, we, that we've planned and executed, uh, making our guys better, uh, making our young guys better, but also making our, our old crusty O5s better uh, because the dynamics of, of combat uh, throughout the world are, are changing and uh, we are stepping up to the task. It, I mean, it's, it's a by-name unit amongst units around the world because of its ability to like think outside of the proverbial A-10 doctrinal box and like, hey, we're going to come up with something new and we're going to do this. And back to the relationships we talked about, maintenance buys in on that. It, because they understand um, to, to stay relevant, you know, you have to you have to adapt, right? Well, it, it is the world's greatest fire squadron. So if you want to come to the world's greatest fire squadron, then there's only one choice. It's a fantastic venue it's 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 a great part of the country you're going to get to fly with good people get to work with good folks um and i think there's going to always be something here uh, and it's not going to go away whether that's fifth gen sixth gen on uh, there's always going to be a mission here it's just it's it's a great location uh in the end i, I think that we'll always be able to uh, attract quality people I wanted to fly fighters and I wanted to be part of the camaraderie that's here. Uh, growing up kind of in the unit as, as a kid uh, from my dad and him being here for the last 20 years was a great opportunity to see not necessarily the operational side but the camaraderie side of the, the unit. Uh, every Christmas party, every 4th of July party was predominantly three or third fighter squadron members and families and seeing the friendships that developed here at the squadron uh, but then outside the squadron and how his best friends are you know, my role models growing up and still are. We had some some awesome people that go clear back to the beginning of this Liberty Balance. Uh, you know, Jimmy Mack, uh, not quite at the beginning with Jimmy Mack, but, but that, that group of guys and good folks like Farmer Burgess and, and uh, Ryan Ronco and Mad Dog Madeline. And these guys took the tone of Professionalism in the air, uh, taking care of families, making sure that, that our enlisted folks throughout the office were, uh, were a part of our organization. And it, it, every unit says, hey, we're a family. This, this organization meant it, and they've always meant it. And those, those shoulders that were standing on that started this out um, made it a special place, and it's still a special place to this day. The key to their success is what these guys built. They handed the baton off to some of us, yeah, who then turned that baton off to the guys after us. And the guys that are running that squadron right now had the baton handed off to them. And it, maybe not exactly how it used to be, but that same relationship still exists, I believe, because of what was started.